All right, so this is the CICD box meeting for September 8th. I have a couple of uh, um, FYI read only items, and we just had a tour of Daniel's apartment. We're doing some icebreaker activities. Uh, they're not being recorded, but it has been fun. Um, and my, I have a first item. I actually want to talk about code review guidelines. Um, so I've been sharing this with you um, in private. We also have been having a, a couple of uh, uh, team conversations, uh, mostly in Verify. But I want to open uh, this space to answer any questions that you might have about code review guidelines um, and what is we expected of, from you, um, how we should be doing code reviews or any questions that you might have so that we can discuss this uh, in this forum. So shoot me. I feel like I don't have any questions. <laughs> I've been talking about it so much and like reading through it so much as we've had, we've been having these discussions on the pipeline authoring team, like just being fully transparent, we're kind of going through some struggles a little bit in our team in terms of how we approach um, UXMR reviews. Um, but I think we'll be just, yeah, I might have some more questions as, um, as we start, as I start doing more reviews, because honestly, lately I haven't had to do a lot of reviews on my team because I don't really get involved in the Mars. That's kind of the problem that we're trying to solve. <clears throat> yeah, but I, I feel like the process is quite clear from the documentation to me. So I don't have any questions right now. Okay. Yeah, anyone else? Just, uh, this is a moment for us, yeah? So even if we don't know what to ask, so feel free also to, to voice that and we can go over uh, some of the most important items. I need to read this documentation. Um, but one thing I caught up with a front end developer for package yesterday um, and he uh, suggested that I don't review things on the GDK and that he can send me screenshots. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear other people's experience with this because my first reaction to that is like, I should probably actually see it working. Um, so in yeah, Python execution, we have been doing that way and it has been very helpful. So uh, it saves a lot of time also because we are working on so many different things and GDK is a little moody, like sometimes it works very well, sometimes it doesn't. So uh, those GIFs, those recordings or uh, screenshots that uh, front-end engineers, they put on the MR description it, it's very helpful. And I think it's also mandatory for them to do that because it comes in the template itself. Uh, I would suggest that, yes, if they're doing that, to encourage them to keep on doing that. And mm -hmm. if you ever feel that you need a larger context of the whole like use case, go ahead and verify that on GDK. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, the last part that Vitka added is really important, right? So sometimes, for example, you're reviewing something that it is a wide change, but it's just copy. So you, you don't need to spin up JDK to review that. But as uh, as you're gonna see once also we we, um, we redocument, right? That's uh, Pedro's KR for this quarter. The code review guidelines is that we want everyone to have GDK up and running and be able to do the reviews locally. If not with GDK, with Gitpod, right? So that we are testing all the different scenarios so for example, uh, some, um, some engineers, when they are giving you that information in the issue description, in the merger class description, uh, through a video or a screenshot, they're not gonna put all the different breakpoints of a UI for you, right? They're mm -hmm. just gonna show what they see. So we want to make sure that when reviewing uh, uh, changes that really impact the, uh, the experience, right? Or how the, how the UI uh, behaves, that you test that locally. So GDK or Gitpod, um, and that's not, yeah, that, that's not uh, required if the scope is too small, but everyone should be doing that and everyone should be able to do that. So Katie, yeah, if your gut feeling says, mm, I need to review this locally, then do it, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned G uh, Gitpod, Hayana. Uh, Katie, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but the most merge requests have a review app that is automatically generated with that change. So it's kind of like a GDK instance for that merge request with that code change. 
So that helps you see the code live already. In some instances, the um, review app either won't be there or there was some problem, but then you can create a Git pod instance for that merge request at any time. So I do that very frequently, even smaller ones. Sometimes I just like hit the Git pod button and just wait for a bit, do something else, and then come back later when it's live and check the code. That's awesome. I didn't know that. So it's really good to know. Yeah. And you'll get uh, more used to it, Katie, once you start working on milestone issues and you're really uh, um, required right, to do uh, these reviews. But um, one of the things I also want to talk about today is the process, right? Because I know, yes, it's a very long uh, documentation page about code review guidelines, but I just want to touch base on the things I find um, I think the most relevant for us, not only now that we have merge request as a, a key performance indicator, but so that we, um, I think we have a good habit of reviewing things, right? So first off, always have yourself assigned as a reviewer. So, and the same as if you want someone to review something, uh, assign them as a reviewer. So I see um, that's different, I think, per team. But the code review guidelines say that if you're working on something, keep yourself assigned as the assignee, right? And ask people to review. And if, for example, you don't have uh, permission, you don't have a, a maintainer uh, level access to a repo, for example, to gitlab.com, and you can merge into the handbook, then someone that is a reviewer with a maintainer access level will ping another maintainer or will merge themselves, right? So um, that's one. And always when reviewing something, hit the approve button if you approve the change. So after you approve, remove yourself from reviewer, but always hit the approve. Um, so for the KPI itself, it's going to be important that we are following uh, this process, uh, that you are assigned to things, that you are reviewing, not only verbally or being pinged in the, in the comments, but using that feature. Um, and another thing is that if you, Ought a change. I think Daniel talked about it yesterday, if not you, Daniel, uh, um, maybe Austin, yesterday during the UX call, we talked a bit about changes that come from the back end but impact the UI. So those are usually not going to be labeled UX, right? Um, so, in a way, have a conversation with your team uh, to understand what are the scope of the changes that, even from back end, that might influence the UI so that you are. Um, aware right and you are able to make a review of these changes so something changed in the api uh, what, what was your example then yeah it's a form right that uh, completely changed yeah it was a form that um we we no longer wanted to allow users to change one field and then i think the initial plan was just to remove it and or, or they already had the plan to disable it but then i jumped in and and did some some small improvements and in, in general, I think it's worth it to keep an eye on what the team is doing because there will always be some small thing that should have some level of UX input, but will pass through. Um, but then it also depends on the on the dynamics of the team, right? Because there's, I think there's always some level of this impression that oh yeah, involving designers in the MR will slow down the MR. So there's always this friction of how much designers should be involved, depending on the team. Yeah, and uh, that's a very good point because our our point is not to slow down the MR, but spot inconsistencies. So um, we had this conversation, I think mostly verify that because we are not being added, designers are not being added, right, to merge request reviews, then we are not tracking wax depth. We are not uh, uh, really looking at, for example, if the component um, are following the pajamas guidelines or if we are using deprecated patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, uh, it's about unblocking people, but at the same time tracking, right, the, the necessary changes that will need to be addressed, that will need to be prioritized by product and by engineering. So that's another point of uh, product designers being the key reviewers for like what added here, any user facing changes. So this is what's in the, the performance, in the, not, not in the code review guidelines, but also in the handbook. User facing changes include both visual, regardless of how minor, and changes to the render DOM that impact the screen um, screen reader. So we're owners, so we are responsible for it. Please read the code review guidelines so that you understand how to perform a review, what is your responsibility, uh, what you need to do after reviewing, et cetera. 
Uh, and if you have any questions, yeah, just reach out and we can continue the discussion. Okay. Any other questions before we jump to the stage group topics? I just had a quick question about Gitpod. So um, I used to rely most on the GTK until it broke. Then I started relying more on the screenshots and having to fix the GDK, like when I do have an MR that really requires um, a more thorough review. And now I'm trying to figure out Gitpod. Um, so one thing I'm struggling with is that when I'm just spinning up uh, a new Gitpod instance and it's not connected to a specific branch, uh, everything works until I switch to the branch that I want to review. And then I just get a bunch of errors and I wasn't really able to fix it. And uh, I got a recommendation to, instead of spinning up uh, like a new Gitpod instance, do it right away for the new branch. But um, I wasn't able to get Gitpod to work with merge requests. I, I'm supposed to enable it in settings, I think. But when I try to save that setting, it gives me an error, like we were unable to save that setting or something like that. So I don't know if anyone experienced this when you, you were setting up your Gitpod. I did experience this, but that was two months back and that was a one-off case. So I did share it with Marcel as well. Uh, mm. And it turned out that long back, uh, users used to face the problem with that, but no more. And my case was just a one-off thing. I never experienced that again, but if it is happening again, I suggest you again, post it in the Gitpod channel on Slack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I will also try it with some other branches. Maybe it could be like a branch mm -hmm. specific problem as well. Right. Yeah. Some branches are problematic. I, there's no reason why, but they just are. <laughs> it's very difficult to be a designer. <laughs> Nadia, are you using the Chrome extension for JetPod? No, I actually use Firefox. Maybe that's the root of all of my problems. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, I, I ask because sometimes I can't find the GitHub button in the UI. I just can't find it. And then if you click the Chrome extension from a commit page or a branch page or an MR page, GitPod is pretty smart and it will know to create a pod exactly from that point in Git mm. history, whatever you are. Uh, so that's a little shortcut, if you just, whatever, just click there and it goes. But then, yeah, if you're having problems with permission, I'm not sure. You, you did add Gitpod in your GitLab settings application, right? So that's that's what I'm struggling with. When I go to settings, I enable it and I click save and it doesn't save. It gives me an error. So it could that's be... That's on Gitpod, not on GitLab. Oh, on Gitpod. Mm. No, that's on GitLab. Um, no, when I go to GitLab settings and I enable Gitpod, I think it's in user settings. Um, it doesn't get saved, but yeah, I will bring it up um, in the Gitpod channel and see if anyone can advise me on that. But also I will try the extension. That sounds like a good hack. Yes, yeah, that works. I had, a, I had a very same issue and reach out to uh, George. Marcel can also help you, but uh, George, because well, he now works at Gitpod. Uh, we have the Slack channel here and I know that George is always looking for feedback on how to improve the user experience for Gitpod. So reach mm -hmm. out to him in the channel um or in private i think he's only added to a couple of channels um now yeah awesome. okay thank you yeah thanks for the discussion and uh then you're uh, you're up next oh you mean the stage groups okay yes so um this week of mine it's kind of similar to the last one right before i went on holidays so at that point, we were starting up the environment survey. Now we are ready to wrap it up. There's already a merge request to remove the, the alert from the UI. Let me open up the survey to make sure everyone has the context uh, real quick. Request. Yeah. So we added this alert on the environments page to add a call out for the survey. The survey ran for about two weeks. Uh, we have more or less 200 responses, which is good. 
not a lot of them are from large customers, which is not so good, um, but we decided to wrap it up anyways and uh, go deeper with interviews in the future if necessary. Um, so now there's another merge request to remove it. It was interesting that we had some feedback from a customer saying that this banner was disruptive for their users. They're a large enterprise customer, so it makes sense that they're kind of cagey with the intrusion. Um, and they asked us if we could make these opt in. So at a settings that they can set, yes, opt out of, of in product surveys and these won't show up for them. Um, we don't have tooling for that right now, but as a proposal it makes a lot of sense. So I will share that with the broader design team as well. And then on top of that, uh, what I'll keep working this week is on the manual deploy approvals. Uh, it has some, some parallels with some work Pitika is doing on job approvals, um, but what, it's a work in progress. And basically add these manual deploy approvals to the environments page because the original design work was made for the pipeline graph. Um, there's a question by Nadia. I can go next after that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask if um, if we have any guidelines for using in prod in product feedback requests because uh, at pipeline authoring we also use them and um, they were very effective at giving us feedback super quickly. Um, but some users also found it disruptive. So I feel like we should be careful with um, using those. Um, but yeah, I, I guess if, if we don't have any guidelines, it'd be good to collaborate on adding something to pajamas perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we have any central guidelines for that. I know there is some, some work being done for, for in product service on the merge request page. And that was one of the mm -hmm. inspirations for me to add this. Um, I, the, if you look at the alert, I'll add more links here because there's not enough links. Um, there's a dismiss button and then it saves your option with a cookie. So if you go back to the page, the alert won't be there anymore. Even so, if you have an organization with 1500 users on GitLab, if all of them open the page, all of them will see it. So it can still be dis disruptive. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll share more links with you. Please share uh, your link for this for this survey, Nadia, and we can we can collaborate on this and share with more people. Sounds good. Okay, uh, my question was around if you and your PM Daniel uh, did identify any large customers that were kind of specifically concerned about this. Because um, like the last time we did this in pipeline execution, which was long back, uh, we got in touch with the TAMS and essays. They are very helpful in such situations. So I'm just wondering if you kind of, if you happen to leverage these channels. So not really. Well, to give a bit more context, the reason for the survey was that even though we have good research around environments, we don't have specific mm -hmm. feedback on how the page is being used. And, and like, mm -hmm. what are the problems with the page? So we, we placed the, the feedback link for the survey in the page specifically for this. That was a definitive choice on that. But then okay. we also know that environments as a feature doesn't work as well for larger organizations. So their feedback was one of the most important. Um, but since most of them are on self-manage and the survey only went to SAS, then we didn't get oh. any from them. So what we did to mitigate this after some feedback from Hayana was to share it with our research coordinators and then they shared the link directly with uh, larger customers in, in GitLab First Look and on social media as well. Uh, so that helped um, scale the numbers a little bit, but not too much. Um, so yeah, like we know that the bigger problems for environments are with larger customers. Um, but mm -hmm. the survey wasn't really the best format to reach them. I think I think directly going to them and to these contacts you mentioned and setting up interviews would be the best way to do that in the future. Okay, great. That I is think good to know. That, that's, that's one of the learnings that I got from this. I'm not sure if it's completely universal, but it feels like surveys are not a good way to get feedback from larger customers and enterprise customers. Right. Um, 
uh, I tend to rely on uh, Doe, my product manager, to connect us with larger customers because, uh, as Vivica mentioned, like he will get in touch with our TAMs and through them we will, he will get in touch with um, our customers. And at this point, we kind of have like a set of a few large customers that are very open to providing feedback, which also means that like we need to get outside of our box sometimes and probably talk to others as well, but still it provides us with really valuable insights. Um, so yeah, I think the product manager can really help with that. Yeah, and then I think just to, to voice what we're discussing here, please also work with Will to document these guidelines, right, from a research perspective, because uh, I know that he's he's working now on uh, improving some of the documentation and some of the assets for research. So I think it's a good uh, opportunity to co collaborate with him and bring these insights so that everyone across the board uh, knows uh, how to collect this uh, in-app feedback, but also if we can um, determine when to use uh, th this type of surveys uh, and, and show these use cases, I think we'll help other designers understand a little bit uh, the pain points and the opportunities. So. Absolutely. And what are, what are ten, TEMs? Um, I'm actually not sure what it stands Te for. <laughs> Technical account managers, so they deal directly with the uh, customers. Oh, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Vitika. I knew what they do, but I didn't know what, what it stood for. <laughs> well, I have every... Googled that way too many times. <laughs> We're all in the room like, we, do we know what this is? Let's just, uh, let's just pretend that we know. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, then uh, feel free to move forward to the discussion. Okay, I think uh, I'm next uh, with some of the issues that I've been working on. I'm just gonna share my screen. Mm. Oh, can you see the issue? Yeah. Not sure which window it's sharing. Um, yeah, so we had this issue to retry manual job with different variables and um, I've already shared it uh, during the last, um, last meeting that we had, and my proposal was to add an action to the pipeline graph. So that's kind of similar to uh, Daniel's journey with the uh, manual deployment approvals where first uh, we looked at adding an action pipeline graph and then after many iterations and confusion uh, realized that it's actually not the right way to go so a similar thing happened to me so what happened was this issue is quite old um, so it was created a year ago uh, since then the issue description has been updated so many times that the initial problem was very difficult to understand um, so I basically misunderstood the problem. The main problem here, um, as it turns out, is that um, maybe I can show, I don't know, what can I show to better illustrate this? Um, so this is what um, a manual job looks like. A manual job is a job that um, you need to run manually. So instead of relying on some predefined conditions, like when the previous job, job is finished running, a new job starts, a manual job requires an action from you. So you would have to actually go in and click the button to run it. Um, so when you do run your manual job, um, you, you can click on the job and hold on, I will find that what it looks like. You have an option to enter manual variables. So um, it's, it's used quite frequently by our users because uh, some you, you may want to override the variables that are uh, by default inherited by this job. And the problem is that you enter these variables during the initial job run, but if you want to retry the job, those variables are not used anymore. So uh, they're basically erased and 
um, you can only retry the job with the default variables, which has been a really big blocker for um, for your workflow because um, you you're not able to properly troubleshoot the job because the variables that you used are basically gone, and now you have to like either um, you basically have to rerun the job from zero. You can't really re retry it with the variables. So I didn't really understand that that was the problem. So what we will be doing is it, we will basically um, make the manual jobs retry with those variables. We will make the manual jobs inherit those um, custom variables. Uh, and the next problem is that uh, when you troubleshoot the manual job, you want to uh, override those variables sometimes to see if it helps you fix the problem. So that's kind of one of the steps in the workflow. So um, initially what I was proposing was this very complex um, design where we would add um, an action to a manual job uh, in the pipeline graph, like an additional option to retry it with variables and not just do like a ba basic retry. And then that would open up um, a model where you would be able to override those variables. But again, there was lots of pushback from the front end team uh, around the solution, uh, even though it can be, um, well, for some workflows, it can be easier if you're using the pipeline graph to stay on the pipeline graph, but um, it would make it difficult uh, for the, page to kind of handle these actions because the pipeline graph is already very complex. We're already having some performance issues with it. So we need to be very careful basically when adding new actions to the pipeline graph. And unless we uh, unless we, we don't have any other way to do it, then of course we can. Or if it's really the only way for us to address the problem and to really fit the user's workflow. But if we can avoid it, we should avoid it. So that led me to an alternative solution also after I investigated all of the different versions that the issue description went through. So I got a better understanding of the problem. So now what I'm proposing is that instead, we um, allow you to override variables in the job page. So when you run the manual job, you're able to enter your custom variables there. Um, and then once the job runs, you have job logs in the job page. And what I'm proposing is that we have different tabs. So the uh, default tab would be job logs. So the default view of the job page will not change basically, except that there will be an additional tab. And then we would have a variables tab where we can surface the variables that are being used. As an MVC, we would only do that for the manual job. So we can use the same form that we already use when we run the manual job with, cu with custom variables and we would surface the variables that were entered during the job run. So that when, you tr when you're troubleshooting your manual job, you will see, okay, so it's using these variables. You can add some other variables so you can override these variables and retry the job with um, th those new variables. And in the future, we can also use this space to surface other variables in the UI. For example, we could surface here just in a read only view, um, the default variables that are being used that the manual job inherits from uh, the rest of the pipeline. Like if you have some global variables or you have variables set up in CICD settings, for example. So this also aligns with Gitika's findings um, around surfacing the variables that are being used in GitLab UI because their users have lots of confusion around how the variables are inherited. So here, you, even if we provided just a view only, um, like something in view, view only mode where you can see what variables are being used that would provide some clarity. So that's where I'm at right now with this issue. And um, We've gotten some feedback from customers that this this seems like a good direction. But if you have any uh, any comments or suggestions around how to make it work, especially Vipika, I know you probably have opinions since you've been working so much on the job page. So I'm curious to hear what you think. I'm so happy to see this. I I love this idea. 
and this really solves so many different problems because I know this MVC is specifically for the manual jobs, but uh, they would also be so useful for every other kind, mm -hmm. especially for upstream and downstream because, oh my God, it's so confusing to just understand what's happening with the variables there. So if you, users are able to see that these are the variables and somehow, I don't know, maybe much, much later in an iteration, if we can say that this is what is being passed from that pipeline to this pipeline, or it's this is what is going from this pipeline to that pipeline, that would be so great. Uh, yeah, and um, this option, first of all, now I actually understand how different this problem was. So probably this is also as much of a backend issue as it is a front-end issue, because now the manual jobs will have to inherit the exact uh, parameters to be retried, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to be a front end issue and a back end issue for sure. And um, I'll keep you posted on our discussions around implementation because right now I, I've still been gathering feedback on this from the customers and the issue. And now I think we'll start talking about how we're, we will actually break this down and implement it. Right. And um, I'll look at this again and provide some feedback later. Sorry, I'm done. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, six, seven minutes uh, left, so we can move uh, the conversation. Thanks, Nadia, for sharing yeah. uh, this. Um, Bitka, you're up next. You're muted. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I had a chance to work on something that I have been wanting to work on since a long time, and I just wanted to kind of share that, the progress with everyone. Um, so there was this issue that Pedro had created some time back when he was working on the whole redesign of um, MR widgets. And it's something that kind of came up in his uh, conversations with other stakeholders in the process. But, and it, the proposal here is pretty simple that the words that we're using in the buttons today, they are very verbose and they kind of communicate more than should be communicated, which kind of like confuses the user and also intimidates them to a level. Uh, and like, how about changing all of those things to just simple auto merge? So telling users that, do you want to auto merge it? Which is like, do you want to use the strategies that you have selected in the settings page? Or do you want to do it manually, like that option? But when I started to dig deeper and get into each one of those Zendesk comments and other issues that were in picture, I figured that it's probably not a task that's so simple. I mean, it's very valuable. Yes, it's going to like help us improve the adoption of uh, our merge train features without even having to push for it because we can just, I mean, if you present it in a very simple way, it would be so much easier for users to uh, start using this. So some a few things that I learned, learned in the process. Um, first was that users would like this option, yes but not at the stage uh, where they're already in the merge request. In fact, they would love to have this while they're creating the merge request. So while creating, they could set that option right there if they want to auto merge it or otherwise, because that's going to save a step for them, like make it really fast. And then the feature would be based on auto merge policy set by the organization users. And today the problem is we have merge checks, we have merge options, then we have merge strategies. And all of these things, they are so jumbled up in the settings. Like if you go to different settings, you'll find different parts of this uh, scattered all around. So for example, I know that uh, merge train pipelines, um, I mean, merge result pipelines and merge train pipelines, they're very codependent. Like you can only enable merge train uh, when you have merge result pipeline enabled. But mer merge train is a strategy and merge result pipeline is not. It's like a merge option. It's a it talks about uh, like what your pipeline should be like and not how you want to merge your uh, MR. So those things have to be separated. We cannot keep on presenting them like this and then say auto merge on the MR because the, if the communication doesn't align, it just creates more problem for us. Then there has to be an emergency exit because uh, users would definitely not want to be trapped into this and feel helpless after that if they want to revert it, if they want to do it manually after setting that. So for a rough proposal, what I propose is that uh, maybe um, a design for like when you're creating a new MR, uh, present an option for auto merge right there. And there's as an emergency exit, present a merge manually option. 
and also an option to go and take a look like what are the uh, strategies which are in place and policies in place uh, that have been set by the organization. Then uh, show the auto merge process through the merge widget. Now, I know that I have a set of like checklist that needs to be checked before I could merge it automatically, but how close am I uh, in the process? Like how many points I've already been through and what am I waiting for now? So to very clearly communicate the progress of uh, those steps in the widget, uh, and this could be done using the design that Pedro has already worked on. So maybe just um, making small little changes to that. And lastly, going back to the settings page and rearranging everything and com communicating very clearly what are the policies and what are the uh, strategy options to uh, just to make sure that everything is communicated in the same format on all the pages. So I had a discussion with Pedro after this and turns out we are kind of on the same page. And so I'll be creating many different issues that we'll be working on iteratively uh, in the future. And for the next thing that I'm doing, it's just like, it's a progress on what's happening with the redesign of the table that I was sharing about in the last two meetings. The challenge there was to create space in the pipeline index page so we can introduce more changes. And currently we are at a place where we have come up with some design which has like substantially reduced the uh, space consumption in the table. And Nadia, I took a few of your suggestions from other issues and put them here. Uh, so we have just one column now which says pipeline and most of the information comes under that. Um, yeah, that's it. And we will be doing a solution validation for this very soon because we are like, even if it is just like UI changes, but there's a lot, many of them. So we need to validate that. Yeah, that's my update. Awesome. Thanks, Vitika. Um, Gina has um, a feedback question here. I, I saw that you already answered uh, Vitika on a runner admin view. She's working on, and she's gonna start working on some more visual deliverables. So please have a look in Gina's comments and uh, answer her questions or leave some feedback here in the docs or in Slack. And Katie, we finally made it <laughs> to you. So do you wanna to talk to us a little bit about your onboarding process? Yes, so this is, um, I think, day seven that I've worked at GitLab, maybe day eight, um, getting into it. Uh, everything's been super great so far. I'm really happy to be here. It's been awesome um, seeing all the collaboration happening. Um, and yeah, I've got some adjustments to do to work with, with GitLab, the product. Um, I've never worked with GitLab before, and even some of the terminology like merge request is new to me, even though I've been using like Git-based tools for 12 years. Um, but I'm sure that that will come in time. Um, and yeah, it's been great meeting everyone for coffee catch-ups. Um, I've had coffee catch-ups with uh, all of you, which is good. Um, and yeah, my biggest struggle at the moment is um, getting a bit more up to speed on the package area. Um, I've watched many, many YouTube videos today. Um, but I think once I get stuck into it, it will be better. I remember when I was reading about Git before I used Git, it all sounded very complex. And then when I did it, I was like, oh, this is actually very straightforward. Um, so yeah, uh, I will be starting my UX scorecard tomorrow. I've got some time set aside with my PM, Tim. Um, he's been on holiday, but he's back now. So uh, hopefully I get some nice hands-on experience then. Mm. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And maybe I think everyone knows that Nadia is uh, Katie's uh, onboarding buddy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Um, I just uh, updated something in your onboarding issue and documented that, that UX uh, scorecard uh, exercise. Uh, so maybe, Vitka, you have some insights also in this process, right, that you're going through with, it, uh, with Gina. So please connect. That'd be awesome. And uh, we're happy cool. that you're here, Katie. <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, I think we are at time, right? Uh, a little bit, I don't know, any more? One second, yes, a bit over time. Um, please leave uh, some feedback um, for Gina, I think. I think that I know that she would appreciate. And anything else? Yeah, see you later on this week. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.